Hi, this is Justin Zeltzer from Z Statistics, and today we're going to take a deeper look at variance and standard deviation, and hopefully answer some of those lingering questions you might have if you've just been introduced to these ideas in class or for your work. Now, I've got the formulas here, the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation, just so we get a sense of how they all work. Let's use a data set that I've stolen off the internet, which is a weekly expenditure on petrol over 12 weeks, which is just about the most boring data set I can think of. So I'm going to have a good old change to that. Weekly expenditure on golden gay times and done. Let's get to it. So as I said, we've got 12 observations and we can calculate the mean and I'm sure most people are going to be fairly comfortable doing that, which is just the sum of all the observations divided by 12. Now note here, we have a summation sign in front of the X. That just means sum up all of the elements of our variable x, which is quite intuitive. And you would do that without a formula, I would think. Now the variance, again, just using the formula for the moment, we'll explain it in a second, but these are the individual deviations from the mean for each observation, then they get squared. So for example, you can take the $48.50, which is my first observation, subtract the mean that we calculated in the previous equation, and then square it. And we do that for each of the 12 observations and add them all together. You can see I've got a dot, dot, dot here. Now, we divide here by n minus 1. Just using the formula at the moment, explain that a little bit later. Now, the variance is often a very large number and it doesn't really hold much intuitive value. It's hard to get a sense of whether that's big or small because everything's been squared. The standard deviation, though, however, square roots that and we get something that's maybe more intelligible and in line with the scale of the data set itself. And we get a standard deviation of $27.35. I've got a feeling that most of you would be comfortable calculating these two things, but I will guarantee you there'll be two questions that get asked. The first of which is why do we bother at all with using this variance term? You heard me mention the fact that it's difficult to assess whether it's high or low because it's squared. So why bother with it at all? And the second question is why we divide by n minus 1 for the variance calculation and therefore also the standard deviation. So I'm going to try to deal with both of these two commonly asked questions right now. First up, why we bother with the variance, i.e. why do we square stuff? Now to answer this question, you've got to put yourself in the position of someone that's trying to describe, say, the spread of a data set. Okay, we know that the mean describes where the data set is, the central location. But if you're trying to describe the spread or the variation in the data set, how would you do it? Well, here's a number line. And let's say the lowest observation is $19.98 and the highest observation is $105.51. And there are the two points on the number line. You can calculate the range as in the highest observation minus the lowest observation and that gives you some kind of sense of the spread of the data but it's not a very statistically advanced measure of the spread is it it's also very susceptible to outliers for example so if you just had one freakishly large number this range would be a huge number purely because of that single observation so you might want to incorporate the rest of of the observations in the data set, and here they are now. So we're gonna ask you, how do you describe the spread of this data? Well, you might, for instance, think, well, I know where the mean is, so I can perhaps find the average deviation from the mean. And I think that's a legitimate first thought for how to describe the spread of this data set. The only problem is, for many of these deviations from the mean, and in this case, I'm showing you the deviation of that lowest observation from the mean. So that's 19.98 minus 58.11. Appreciate that that's a negative deviation. Now, all of these on the left-hand side will provide you with negative deviations, and all of these observations on the right-hand side are gonna provide you with positive deviations. So if you're actually trying to find the average deviation, you're gonna to have to sum them all up and divide by, well, 12 here, right? I'm hoping that you're seeing the problem with that, you're actually gonna get zero because the sum of all those deviations is zero. By definition, that sample mean lies right in the middle of that data set. So all of the negative deviations will equal out with all of the positive deviations from the mean. 
Okay, so that's not going to work. So what can we do instead? Well, here's a second thought. Let's find the average squared deviation from the mean. Now, you only need a very basic understanding of mathematics to appreciate that when you square one of these deviations, like this one here, minus 38.13, what happens to it? Well, it becomes positive, right? So squaring that gives us 1453 point whatever, and then we're going to add all of those squared deviations together, which are all now positive, and we can find the average of those squared deviations. And that might give us some numerical measure of the spread of this data set. Now, if you're a real smart aleck, you might think that, well, why don't we just take the absolute value of all of these deviations and not worry about squaring things? Well, technically you could take the absolute value of all of these deviations and then find the average of that. There's nothing stopping you doing that. But as a convention, we don't do that. And there's good reason for it. Because this variance where we're taking these squared deviations from the mean actually forms part of a larger study of statistics, which we call moments. So variance is actually a form of the second moment of this data set. And believe it or not, there are third and fourth moments as well, which involve cubing the deviations from the mean and taking these deviations to the power of four. So indeed, while you could take the absolute value of things, that, nece that won't necessarily play ball with the higher order of these moments that are useful in more advanced analysis. So we're gonna have to deal with the average squared deviation from the mean, which might look something a little bit like this. The sum of x minus x bar squared, all divided by n, which is the number of observations. And you'd think it'd be that, except of course, you saw in the formula on the previous sheet, it's actually divided by n minus one. That's where we get to our second question. Why do we divide by n minus one? Well, this involves your ability to distinguish between what a population mean and a sample mean is. So the variance technically is the average squared deviation from the population mean. So as an example, let's just take the very first two observations from our data set here, week one and week two. Where in week one, I spent $48.50 on Golden Gay Times, and in week two, I spent $87.40. Here are the two points on a number line. Now, if we're gonna to try to find the average squared deviation from the population mean, Appreciate that the population mean could be anywhere on this number line. It could be over here, or it could be over here. And at each spot, we could find each of the deviations from that population mean and square them, and then find the average of those two. So our estimate could be x minus the mean, that's mu here, all squared, all divided by n. In this case, n would be two. And that would give us an estimate of the variance. Unfortunately, we don't actually know where the population mean is. It's a bit of a fiction to think that, oh yeah, of course we know the population mean is up on this side. This is a theoretical example. And in real life, we're not gonna know exactly where the population mean is. I've only got a sample of size two here. So the best we can do is to estimate that population mean. And we do that by taking a sample mean. And again, we can find those squared deviations from the sample mean. So we can go x minus x bar squared and sum them together. And there'll be two of those to sum together. But what are we gonna divide by to take that average? Well, you think two, right? Because there's still two of these squared deviations from the mean. But think about it. We're trying to find the average squared deviation from the population mean, wherever that is. But we're using x bar as an estimate of that population mean to approximate it. So the sample mean x bar is just one possible position for the true population mean. As I said, the population mean could be anywhere along here. And if that population mean was at any other position, this sum of squares calculation would be larger. So in fact, this sample mean, if we're using that to approximate the population mean, is actually making this calculation the smallest possible calculation it could be. Think about it. In our original example, we had the population mean way up here. And those distances were much larger. And in fact, it doesn't matter where you put the population mean, the square distances, when you sum them together, will be larger than the square distances from this sample mean. So we have to take account of that. Otherwise, our estimate for the true variance will be less than it should be. So by dividing by n minus 1 instead of n, appreciate that the denominator is decreased, 
so our estimate actually increases. So as I say here, smaller denominator adjusts the variance estimate upwards, and that's to account for the fact that we've used an approximation of the population mean when we used the sample mean. Now again, you might still be asking, well, okay, sure, we need to subtract something from that denominator, but why subtract one? Why can't it be n minus two or n minus anything? Well, I'm gonna attach a, an Excel spreadsheet to this video in the description, and you can see how I've shown at least empirically that this is going to be true. So feel free to download that spreadsheet and see me try my hand at empirically deriving that equation. But for the moment, I hope you appreciate that we need to subtract one from this denominator so that we appropriately inflate our estimate of the variance. So that's it, but I do wanna finish with uh, the elephant in the room, which is this concept of degrees of freedom, which is often coming up in statistics and very much hand waved away by lecturers and tutors alike. So I'm gonna try my best at explaining through this example, what degrees of freedom represents. So let's take a new data set where the population mean mu is 53. And let's just say the first two observations of this data set are 41 and 59. Now I could construct a new column, which is X minus the mean. In other words, the deviation from the population mean. And each of these would have their own deviation. The first is minus 12 because it's 12 units below the population mean. And the second is plus six. Now for this third observation, appreciate that it could be whatever it wants to be. There is nothing restricting it at all. So let's just say the third observation is 50. Now contrast this with the scenario where we might have the sample mean given to us instead of the population mean. So here we've got the same idea. We've got the first two observations. The first one happens to be 61 in this case, and the second is 51. And the deviations there are plus three and minus seven from our sample mean. So you can see here I've got X bar as opposed to mu in the previous table. Now what can our third observation be in this case? Well, unfortunately, it can't be whatever it wants. We know that the sample mean is 58. And by definition, that sample mean lies right in the middle of this sample. So all of these deviations must sum to zero. Of course, meaning that that third deviation must be plus four if they're to sum to zero. So plus three minus seven plus four will give zero, indicating that this third observation must have been 62. In other words, there's only two independent pieces of information in this second data set. In other words, we can say there's two degrees of freedom, whereas in the first example, there were three degrees of freedom. Each of these observations could be whatever they wanted to be. So that in some ways explains how we get these two different formulae for the population mean. This is the sigma squared, which is our calculation of the variance when we actually have an entire population here. And you'll notice it's x minus mu squared all over n. Whereas if we do not have the population mean and we have to rely on x bar, we divide by n minus one to take account of that loss of one degree of freedom. So in this case, we'd be dividing by two. And that might explain a little bit as to why this one on the left is called the population variance and the one on the right is called the sample variance. So that's it. I hope that's been somewhat informative and if you like this video, feel free to check out some of my others. I'm progressively putting up more and more these days. If you want to subscribe and do all those kind of things, here are the links to do all of that.